Das? Ja. So, welcome everybody. For the next presentation, we have a case study. So, we heard a lot of things about responsive design, responsive web design, techniques, how to make it, whatever. And we're really happy to have Vitaly here, which is actually the second time he is. He was already um, last year at the Frontend Conf, and he presents us his own website, <laughs> Smash Magazine, a case study about responsive web design. Welcome, Vitaly. Thank you. It's always actually really great to be here this second time in a row. Um, I've met a couple of familiar faces from the last year, which is actually great. Um, thank you for coming second year in a row. I, I haven't disappointed you last year, apparently. That's good. Um, this would be me. I like to smash things around, um, especially articles. Some of you might have heard of one of them, uh, Smashing Mag. How many of you have seen it before? Okay, wait a second. I have a classic, so how many of you have heard of it before? Come on. <laughs> the best thing is that it's actually captured on video. Can we cut it later on? No? Okay. I don't mind. So, um, I'm the guy who founded Smash and Mac back in 2006. Um, we had a major redesign project in actually the whole last year and um, the first two months of this year were dedicated to a redesign. Um, it's been a huge task, actually. It took over, over nine months of work, and it took quite a lot of, a lot of time to develop. It's really a lot of time to develop. So overall, we had six people working on the project. We had Eddie and Jay Stocks, who was doing mostly you know, design stuff, front-end stuff. We had Ben working on front-end, Ryan doing front-end and back-end. Robin was doing most backend, mostly. You know, I was making everybody nervous, yeah, trying to you know work on this and that and this and that, different things, IA usability and so on and so on. And Iris was working on IA and microcopy. So, how many of you are actually front-end developers? Okay, ooh, scary. Um, backend developers? UX people? Okay, bankers, <laughs> doctors, not even one? What's wrong with you people? Okay, cool. Um, it's just good to know so I know exactly what to talk and what not to talk about. So, in this talk, I actually would like to present some findings that are really kind of made the redesign what it is today, meaning that we have experienced a couple of things, a couple of problems along the way, we have exper experimented with a lot of tools, most of them didn't work out, uh, some of them did. And maybe some of the things that I'm going to present today will provide you with some context about tools and techniques that you can use in your regular work. So, why redesign, actually? How many of you remember this? 2006, we just picked a random WordPress theme and went live. With this article, article that actually drove us a lot of traffic. 2006, 2008, how many of you have seen it before? Oh, now we're getting somewhere. 2009, 10, you're just lazy, aren't you? Come on, come on people, I, just, I want some feedback from you. How many of you have seen it before? Let's try again. Ah, oh, wonderful, okay. And 2011, and if you look closely, you will probably find out that Mostly, the design hasn't changed a lot. Like, the layout has changed, uh, hasn't changed at all. The design elements, some visual elements have changed a bit, but you basically have the same. Uh, well, apart from the fact you have more visual graphics on the right side, right? But essentially, we have a column, main column, and we have a sidebar, and that was it. Now, it was a problem, because actually, in 2011, we have done many, 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 many changes to Smash Magazine. You've been following us for a while. You probably know that we used to, you know, <sighs> produce these list posts and roundups and stuff like that. And in 2011, there was a huge major shift, essentially from one day to another. 
when we started doing more advanced professional articles going in a different direction, really actually becoming a professional online publication. Have you noticed that? No? Yes? No? Don't care? Okay. Come on, people, I expect something from you. Right, so there are many changes, many changes happen in the background, but nobody actually noticed them because the design hasn't changed. We also face some major problems and issues, usability issues. For example, we had a huge bloated code base. So you should imagine it this way. Essentially, we set up this WordPress theme six years ago, and over years, we've been you know, adding stuff, improving stuff, trying to make code better. Didn't work out, really. Because after five years, the code was really like hell. We also had long response times, and our ad advertisers weren't happy with that. We had a lengthy UX depth list. And what I mean by saying that, that we actually had a lot of UX features we really wanted to implement, but couldn't because the code base wouldn't allow us to do it a reasonable amount of time. So there are many things we wanted to do, but we couldn't. The so navigation, especially for people coming from Google, turned out to be a mess, like a real mess. Our usability test uh, turned, uh, well, showed us that people who come from Google can't really navigate the site because the information architecture was terrible. And we had two other things, decreasing ad impressions due to wonderful tools such as readability or Instapaper. How many of you use, use readability or Instapaper? I, I, I have all night, I have all day. You can, you can just, you know, come on, how many of you use it? You see, this is a problem we have, thank you very much. Right? Because it turned out that in, early to, in late 2011, we had 13% of people using readability or Instapaper instead of reading articles on Smash and Mac. As a publisher, it's a big deal for us, because we lose essentially money, right? And also we notice that actually the quality of comments on the site is not getting better. You know, people are you know, more slow, they don't want to reply, don't want to leave a comment, they don't interact with us. This is something we didn't, we didn't want to hear. So if you look at the site, then if you look at the heat map of the site, you'll find out that eventually, actually, there is not much going on, right? Some of the areas are clicked, right, but not many of them. And if you go further down, it's getting even worse. So, some people did read us, some people did read us in Instapaper, readability, or RSS feeds, but people didn't come to our site. And that's a big problem. So, in the end, we turned out to be like this guy, right? So, we're telling, hey, users, we're so cool, we implemented new features, we did this and that and that. Do you like it? And they go, nah. And it's really disappointing because we try to improve things all the time and users didn't like it. So we had to change something. So this is the main reason why we have had to do a redesign. So how did we start? Well, we started with goals and requirements, of course. So we've gathered general requirements first. We wanted, of course, to have the site focused on content, right? Because it's the base of what Smash Magazine is all about. We wanted to have a consistent navigation for your change, right? Because also, the site has evolved over time, and we had a lot of legacy content as well. So we had to find a way to organize it. We wanted to have a wonderful, beautiful, lean semantic code base, right? Finally, also for the first time, it's been a while, CSS3, HTML5, and WordPress. And now, two questions emerged. So, okay, what do we do with browsers? And what do we do with advertisers? Now, it's getting interesting. So we looked at stats. So what the first thing that actually jumped to my mind is this thing over here, where, you, where we see that 12 people actually were using Internet Explorer 99. <laughs> it was a big deal, because I had no idea what this browser is, actually, right? <laughs> and what it can or cannot, right? But we left it aside for a while. We found out that 151 people actually per month I use an Internet Explorer 5.5. Well, we can live with that, I think. Poor people, but okay, we can live with that. But what was more important, actually, 
is that we had, oops, sorry, is that we had over five, almost 5% five of users using A8. So that was something that we couldn't ignore. So we had to support A8. At the same time, it's also important that A6 or 7 were not that important. So we actually expected it. It's not something that you have in most projects, but we're in a lucky position to have this luxury, right? So then we looked at desktop resolutions. And of course, if you look at desktop resolution, it's not really, it's not giving you the information that you actually want. Because what you want to have, you want to have a browser viewport, right? You don't really want to have a desktop resolution. But it was something that we could work with. So what we found out here is that 5.4% were using 1024. So 5.4% is kind of a significant number in our case. And our advertisers didn't want to, you know, advertising to not appear at 1024. And also we had running contracts with our, with our advertisers as well. So the kind of the constraints that we had to work with, the ads had to be displayed at 20, 1024 at least. At latest, sorry. You know what I mean? Right? So because we had running contracts, we had to make sure that the advertising blocks appear at the very same spot before the redesign and after the redesign. It was a terrible, terrible constraint to work with. It's been hell, hell. You don't feel my pain, people. Come on, what's wrong with you? It was terrible. It was really difficult to work with. Because, of course, we want to have a wonderful, responsive site. But then we had this wonderful 1024 block that we had to work with somehow. Had to make sure that advertising is in, in it. Is in it. Of course, we want to have these nice features. Site had to be fully accessible without images in JavaScript. We wanted to have as few images as possible because we wanted to focus on content, stable performance, and a meaningful responsive layout. So we didn't want to go crazy, all responsive, and create just stuff because it has to be responsive. We wanted to see what can we do to make the site responsive, but make sure that it actually makes sense. Right? So once we had that, we created our design persona. And I think that most of you know what it is. Of course, usually we know already what user persona is, right? We know our, some of us know our users, we did in our case, but we wanted to figure out, because we're doing a redesign, we wanted to find out who we are. We wanted to find out what are the values and the philosophies that we want to communicate to our audience. So we created this document that essentially outlines the key traits or the personality we wanted to convey in our design. And it looked very simple. We collected three things. Existing attributes, wish list attributes, and no-go attributes. And essentially, we just checked to make sure, OK, this is where we are, this is what we want to be, and this is what we don't want to be. So for example, existing attributes, reliable, helpful, community-oriented, right? wish list attributes, want to be clean, engaging, respectable, trustworthy, and we didn't want to be pretentious, annoying, superficial, or cheap. Now, you might think, why? Why do you create things like that? The thing is that we had a team of six people, but each person working on the project was working remotely. It was really, really important for us to have a document, or some kind of an agreement of who we want to be, and also the things that we can always go back to in case we have, any, we have to make any design decision. So every design decision that we, wanted to, that we had to make in the end had to pass the judgment of the design persona and also design manifesto we created. So what it was essentially, it stated clearly how we want to build things and what is important to us. Like we should primarily focus on readability and legibility of the site. And the second was, for example, it was a longer document, actually. We should not get encumbered by plotted features like unnecessary JavaScript libraries. Right? It was really important to have a manifestation of what we want to achieve, because we could always go back to it and, see and find out if we're doing things right. Now, OK, we kind of have the settings. We knew what we wanted to do. How do we build it? And what do we build? So essentially, and I think you, 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 I think you think the same way, to be honest. Essentially, we had to focus on finding an answer for one single question. Namely, 
how do we make our ad-supported content more interesting to users than you know, readability or Instapaper? That's the main problem we had. That's the main problem we wanted to solve. Because obviously, this is more readable than this. Do you agree? Yes? No? Don't care? Something? Please, something. Yes. OK. So we had to think about it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> At least you're honest. Thank you. And so what we felt is important is to try to, well, try to find an answer for the, to this question, of course. And we've been thinking a lot. And the only solution we came up with would be to try to focus on content, right? Try to make sure that the reading experience we can provide on our side is better than on other sites. Well, of course, we have advertising. We have to. But perhaps by using rich typography, but using something that would make typography or articles so special, we could make people actually come to our site, come back to our site from Instapaper readability. So we started with this. It looked very clean, and <laughs> it's a good place to start with, actually. We actually really wanted to re rethink the whole thing. So we started looking around. And we've mainly started looking at sites where typography really matters. And we were thinking, OK, what can we do? Should it be like a magazine style, or should it be something different? So this was the first mock-up, and the only document we've done in Photoshop, actually. This is the only document we've done in Photoshop. Where we tried to figure out, OK, this might be, might be something. Right? We have a navigation, secondary navigation, primary navigation, and articles, and search. Makes sense, right? This is how the first implementation looked like. This is how it looked on iPad. And my problem with that is that I don't really see any content in here. Do you? No. Oh, this something's coming. That's good. That's good. You're warming up. Come on. Okay. That's cool. So we said no, we cannot go this way. Doesn't make any sense. So we started looking somewhere else. And the place that we started looking was actually really surprising to me. I, I, I wasn't ready to actually accept this idea of going this direction, but Elliot wanted. So what we did is we started looking at mobile applications, iPad applications, Android applications, iPhones applications. And we started to look at applications, apps, where typography matters, where they, you know, font tools or something like that, or magazine tools, or tools like Path, right? And we kind of like the idea of having this multi-column layout, and we like the idea of focusing on content and then having kind of things shifting around. So we thought, okay, what if we do something different for a while, for a change? What if we create a multi-column app-like experience? for a website. When I heard this for the first time, I went nuts, seriously. I wanted to kill Elliot, I wanted to take my money back, and I didn't want to do it at all. Because I felt, it's, how can it work? It can't work. Do you want to have swipe with jQuery, swipe or whatever on, on desktop side, on a responsive side? Ooh, I don't know. But we thought, OK, let's see what, what we can do. So initially, the idea was, OK, we have columns have lots of columns. We have five columns for 2,000 pixels plus. So we would have a media query kicking in and at 2,000 pixels, right? But we would have comments, ads, article navigations, a primary navigation and secondary navigation. And then as we go down mobile, well, it will be linearized, right? It's just very simple, actually, to think about it. But what was important is that for us, redesign was more than just about changing layout. Right? It was really about rebranding, because we changed a lot of things. For example, we changed colors. Some of you might have noticed it. But we also changed invoice templates, email signatures. We changed ebook formats, ebook design, book design, all kind of things. It was really important for us to understand, OK, this is the direction we go. This is how we represent ourselves. And so we stick to it. We even changed our Twitter birds and developed a special strategy for that. Have you noticed that? Of course you didn't. Have you? <laughs> Have you? Really? You make me so happy. Who, who, who was it? Oh, one person? 
two, three. Oh, it makes me so happy. It took us really hours to actually think about what, it, what we want to do with our Twitter birds. So the idea here is that we actually changed our Twitter gravatar depending on the mood and the atmosphere in the office. So if we have a huge workload, for example, we'll have probably not the one, not the guy in the middle, but the guy in the left upper corner. So we really actually thought about different things, many things. So we had this vision of what we want to do. The question now was, okay, how do we do it? So we started with something that we called not mobile first, but typography out approach. And the main idea here is that we will actually have one main constraint that would actually define the whole design. And that would be perfect measure, or line length, if you, if you want in CSS. Yeah, actually, line, line length, not in CSS. Right? So it was important for us to make sure that we do our best to ensure that on all screen resolutions, on all devices, we have a perfect line length. So that the reading experience is perfect, always. Doesn't matter whatever you use. This is the main constraint we started working with. And the idea was if we could adequately um, typeset an article and then an article and thus establish the general context of the design, everything else would follow. So the key attribute for achieving perfect typesetting was a perfect measure, a good average between 45 and 90 characters per line, everywhere, literally everywhere. And if you know Elliot, you know that he is a perfectionist. He likes to work, to work with grids, and he likes perfect grids. And he actually wanted to go this way first, but we, there is no way we can do it, especially with all the legacy content that we have. We had to do something more pragmatic, and we had to do compromises. So, what did we do? Okay, we started with typography, right? We went to Typekit and to FontDeck and all the sites and tried to find a typeface that we liked, that would actually reflect our personality. And it was so exciting. I felt like, I felt crazy, really. <laughs> I really felt like I'm a kid in a sweet store, literally. We could pick this stuff, and we could pick this stuff, and we could experiment, and we could test it, and we could do all these things that we never thought we could. Right? It was an exciting time, really exciting time. But something happened after, shortly after that. Of course, because we had this huge rebranding phase, not only redesign phase, we had to make sure that typefaces are optimized for different contexts. Ebooks, um, you know, print stuff, ebooks, um, magazine, everything. So uh, it was not that easy because we quickly realized. So some fonts look like shit everywhere, literally everywhere. So we tested a lot of things, and most of the time we got these results, especially in our lovely Windows XP, of course, but it was so disappointing. You have no idea, really. You can't feel my pain, I think. But it was really so, it was difficult to, to deal with, really difficult. So once we discovered that, we started looking at our stats. Do we need to take care of Windows XP? And guess what? We do. Because we had 16% of people using Windows XP for some reason. So this was one of these moments <laughs> where we started thinking, now this is probably, my life is not as easy as I thought it will be. I can make a nice photo of it. Excellent. So we had to start somewhere. So we experimented with lots of fonts, and most of them didn't work. But some of them are hinted, and properly hinted for Windows, so we can use them. So one of them was Scholar. And we also experimented with, with um, LFT Etica and many others. And we created templates, essentially just to get a feeling of how things work, how things look like. But we just didn't just check different typefaces. We also check different type foundries, or actually font delivery services. Do you know why? So if you have, let's say, if you have Proxima Nova from Typekit and Proxima Nova for Font Deck, will they look the same? Who says yes? Who says I don't care? And who says the right answer? 
Ah, oh, excellent. The answer is no, because it depends on how, it depends on hinting, of course, it depends on the outlines that are submitted to type to fund it. And very often you'll find out that they're different. Now, extra question for you. Will, it, will a typeface from TypeKit look the same as your mock-up in Photoshop using the same typeface? <sighs> you, you make me happy. You're a great audience. You make me happy. Thank you for that. Um, they're different. They are different. In the end, we actually dis decided to go with this. So we had Scholar for uh, headings, main headings, and we had Proxima Noir for body copy. Do you like it? Oh, excellent. Okay, wonderful. Well, it's getting better. So, once we had that, we had to figure out a way of how do we progress, how to proceed. So, we started to experiment and play around with it. So, we added a couple of lines, advertising, of course, secondary navigation, primary navigation. We, at some point, we also wanted to have something like color highlighting for different sections of the site. And we had to take care of horizontal navigation as well, of course, for tablets. And at some point, we had this, right? We had the search first under the logo, right? But the usability test proved that it's, it was a bad, 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 bad idea, right? So we moved it right to the logo, next to the logo. Do you like it from the overall feeling? You, you don't care anymore. What's wrong with you, kid? Yeah? But then we discovered something. This is how it looked on an iPad. Are you missing something here? Yes, excellent. We forgot to add the ads. Oh. <laughs> Actually, it was one of those, these situations, because we had to consider, OK, do we do it? What, what side do we take? We care about our advertisers, of course, but we care about the audience. So it was a difficult, difficult thing to do, but we had our requirements, right? So we had to squeeze the advertising in somehow. This is how it started looking after that. So it wasn't something we were extremely happy about, but was something that we could work with first. Um, but what's important here is that actually while typography and lang length was actually the major um, constant in our process, we did a lot of crappy things on the side. So all the other elements in the design were actually variables. So we did all kinds of things. For example, we introduced at some point in the design process, we introduced selected articles that would appear below under the pagination on the front page. Or we would use something like brief next navigation and keyboard shortcuts, right? And all the other things that we actually tried to figure out, does it make sense or doesn't, right? And what we did with that, um, let me just show a couple of examples first. Search box and so on, also mobile sites look like, not mobile site, but uh, mobile view looked a bit different. And how we call it internally was a chameleon approach to design. So we never actually worked towards one final solution, one final design, at no point. We actually, we collected these elements that we could use later on. We put them in the library. And at some point, we would just pick one, put it live, figure out how well it works, put it back, analyze it, and then if it's a good idea or a good feature, we would actually add it live. So as we were developing the site, we were collecting this library of you know, different sections, tools, and um, the blocks and so on that we can use later on. So we kind of had an idea of what we want to build. Now the question was, how do we do it, right? What tools did we use? Well, we used, I had for one talk today, where we discussed that maybe designing in the browser is not that good idea. So the whole Smashing Magazine redesign was built in the browser, completely. Only the first sketch that you've seen in the very beginning was done in Photoshop, nothing else. We haven't used any sophisticated tools like grid systems or less, stuff like that. We used SVN. I know Git is cooler, more cool, right? But we used SVN, WebKit Inspector, and Window Resizer extension in Chrome. And this is how it looked for months. My, my, um, my girlfriend was, came to me once, and she saw this, right? And she, was, uh, she, she went and said something like that, aren't you doing the same thing all the time? <laughs> What's, you've been doing it for, for months now. What's going on here? 
right? So we actually, this, is, this was our working environment. And it uh, works pretty fine, actually. So we used a customized HTML5 boilerplate, modernized and respond JS for AE8. Um, but what's important, actually, is that the existing styles in the style sheet were all written by new ones. So this is what, this is what I mean by saying that. Essentially, we start with Reset CSS, then we start with Zero Up, which is basically base CSS, and then for every media query that we add, we kick in a new CSS file. 500 up, 600 up, and so on. It was very helpful for development because we had remote people working remote, remotely on the same project. And of course, for the production code, we would pack it all together and make sure that we have one single file. The markup was styled as fluid grid, and we used AMs and percentages for everything, of course, right? But what was more interesting in this case was that Elliot has a specific vision of what he wants to build and how he wants to build it. So at no point did we use values such as 2.3 AMs or 23 pixels. He had always used 25, 20, 15, 10 pixels or 2%, 2%, 2.5, 3%, and nothing in between. Never. It's actually a big deal. It caused some difficulties along the way, but it was really interesting because it kind of enforced this design to be well-structured and, well and look fine, and at least more, more or less meaningful. Do you know what I mean? It was a really difficult constraint to work with. It was really interesting to work with it. So, in the development phase, we started with mobile, and then worked like mobile first, of course, and we started to, to grow to desktop later on. And how it worked was really easy. At every point of the process, we just looked where line length becoming, is becoming too lengthy, and then we would kick in a media query to kind of solve this problem. And the nice technique that we developed, actually, is to use asterisks after 90 characters, and once we see that after asterisk suddenly text appears on one line, then it's a sign that we have to change things. Do you know what I mean? Oh, nice. At least one person appreciates it. That's wonderful. <laughs> no, but it's actually, it's, it was very simple, but it helped us to kind of get the visual feedback of how we're going. And if the line length is becoming too long at some point. So we never targeted specific devices. So we never had media query again in for iPad or Android and so on. We tested it later on, but we never actually de uh, designed specifically for specific resolutions. We had media queries kicking in at 767 pixels or so, right? Just because it made sense to break this problem with land length. So now comes something that Stoyan will hate, I think. Um, in the production, in the development phase, we used Mini as alias to display elements on smaller browser views. So essentially, it looked like this. We would have double markup in the, production, in the development phase, where we would actually see, okay, this is how it will look on mobile, this is how it will look on normal desktop, de um, desktop view, right? And then we would have display none. Now, this is something that you shouldn't do, should never do, right? This is bad practice, and nobody likes it. But for development phase, it was actually very helpful. Now, the problem is that we kind of didn't manage to meaningfully replace it in the production code. So we are still struggling with it because we haven't figured out the right way to optimize for mobile. But it actually helped us a lot during the development phase. But at some point, we figure out, OK, so we're optimizing things all the time. And navigation, for example, was a primary example for that. Because things kept changing all the time. And at some point, I felt something is wrong. And I was again in this situation. Because I felt we are changing things all the time. But is it actually really something that users want? They want to have navigation and horizontal navigation at some point, and then when they resize the window, having its secondary navigation somewhere on the side. Do they want it? In the beginning, before we actually started the project, we felt actually responsive design should be designed by default. 
This is a new approach for web design in general. At some point, I was really skeptical, because I wasn't sure if we were doing the right thing. Can you see how many of you think that having a responsive design by default is a good idea? So if you design a website, it should be responsive. Who disagrees? OK. So at some point, after a couple of months of uh, intense development, a lot of code was thrown away, right? And a lot of code was written again. So we took nine months of work to develop the whole site. I don't think that is what most projects can afford, right? So I still think that responsive design should be a default decision, default design. But it's, it's not as easy as some think, some people think. We use lots of CSS free, of course. We kind of managed to avoid images with all the nasty, wonderful things that you know, right? And this is how our um, sprite looked like. Isn't it cute? For the whole site. This is a sprite for the whole site. Actually, I can't actually see it. We have a rectangle, which is the background. Actually, we could reduce it and maybe save 20 bytes or so. It would be an option as well. But this was the whole sprite for the whole site. But this is how CSS looked like. And we will have a lot of, and I know it already now, we have a lot of maintenance issues because we really have to check what is supported where. So it's not easy to maintain. It's actually a nightmare to maintain. Um, it was fun to develop, though. Um, so how many of you know box sizing? Most of you. Excellent. Um, the, we had a couple of things that we wanted to fix, and at some point I discovered box sizing. And it was like a wow moment for me. You know this moment when things change? The whole universe collapses, or uh, you know, things change for always. This was the moment when I discovered box sizing. So of course you know the issue, I don't have to explain too many details here, but for those of you who don't know, so classical situation, you have let's say three blocks, each of them has a 33% of width, Right? But you also want to have a border, which would have a couple of pixels, and you probably want to have a padding, which might be a couple of AMs. Right? You run into the problem where you have different values, and they do not add up to 33%. You know what I mean, I guess. Yeah. And what if you want to change from, let's say, three columns to two columns? Then you have a problem. So you can do it easily. I won't go through all the details. You can do it easily, and it was actually real Saver for me. I won't go for details. I don't think it's necessary. And it's supported in IE8, which is exactly what we wanted. And you're not fascinated at all. <laughs> well, you are now at least. That's good. But it was a big deal. I was like happy. Like you can't even imagine how happy I was. So we used transitions, subtle transitions, to make experience a bit smoother. And actually, it worked very nicely in usability tests where we actually noticed that small transitions, even transition on border color, makes a huge difference. So people actually laughed that we had a transition on border color. It's kind of an unusual thing to have a transition on border color. You're not fascinated again? <laughs> OK. But it, it was really interesting, because I didn't expect it to have a, such a huge effect on UX. But it did, for some reason. And we cared about also all these little details. How many of you tried to print out a Smash Magazine article? You're killing me here, really? Seriously? Now, we are doing all this stuff, invest two or three weeks of work, um, weeks of work and you don't even care. <laughs> this is unbelievable. This is freaking unbelievable. You make me really, really sad now. You have no printers? You have no printers? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea what's wrong with you guys. So. What's the first thing you should do if you go home? Oh, you're on laptops right now. Please try to print it out, even in PDF. It was because you have to have a print style shit. You said <laughs> it's important to have a nice print style shit. If people want to use it, for example, if you want to, if you want to, if you're using readability or Insta paper, why don't you just send it to your Kindle or to your iPad or whatever as a PDF, for example, or EPUB? Why do you have to use Insta paper readability? This is crazy. <laughs> Seriously. So if you go, if you go on an article and you like the article but you hate ads, you have two options. This is my trick for you. You have two options. Either you resize the window, 
right? <laughs> or you try to print it. Because this is how a print style sheet looks like. And we even have footnotes. And you don't even care. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Seriously, this is so cool. And I hate people who don't care about print style sheets. Because it's, <laughs> it's just 10, it's just 10 10 lines of code or so, and then people who actually print it, and I know people who actually print our articles or save them because they think maybe the article will disappear or something, right? They know people who actually save it as PDF, and they are so happy. <laughs> you have no idea how many people you can make happy by just creating a print style shit. But okay, I don't mind, really. I, I used to it, to be honest. So now when it comes to more important things, that, even more important things than print style shit, we had to think about what do we do with all the browsers. We, hadn't, we didn't have to do anything, because this is how it looked in IE6. I mean, you're not fascinated at all. What's wrong with you, seriously? We, hadn't, we didn't have to do anything. So essentially, HTML5 boilerplate helped, and Modernizer and ResponseJS helped as well but it was really uh, easy to work with. Now, performance optimization is still something that we are not quite sure about how to deal with it, and Stan is really happy right now. Um, we had a lot of tests and a lot of things to make sure how it is the right solution for that. So we used this tool called, which is now part of Firefox, which, um, which was a Firefox extension tilt, which helps you visualize your code. So as we were developing, we were looking at Tilt to, to understand, is the code more or less fine? So it looked quite flat, which is good, right? Until we started doing something. And then we started adding social buttons. Twitter buttons, and Hacker News buttons, and Facebook buttons, which we removed right away later on, and so on. And we found out that the performance hit was huge. Really huge. So we started removing them. And the interesting thing happened. Am I allowed to say that? OK. The interesting thing happened, because he is the guy, if you, if you ever dislike the like button, you can blame him. <laughs> yeah. Because he's kind of, he's developed it. He's developing it, sorry. He's not invented it, he hasn't invented it, but he's developed it. Um, so what we found out, once we removed the Facebook button, the quality of comments increased on the smashing side. And also, the traffic coming from Facebook increased as well. Which is, I don't see a real um, connection here, but I think that people actually were starting posting our articles manually on their timeline. And of course, it means more to their friends or colleagues instead of just having a role he liked it. You know what I mean? So we actually noticed it. It was very interesting. But we removed the buttons, and everybody was happy. So sometimes you remove things, and then the other thing happens, kind of thing, which was cool. So we did some server-side and front-end optimization, of course. We actually have set up a new, completely new and expensive load balancing server architecture, um, which, because we knew that the performance wasn't good before the redesign. So we had to do something. We had all kind of weird caching, which I have no idea about because I'm not a backend developer. JZIP compression minified as JavaScript. Um, we also have kind of tried to deliver minified or cached small images to mobile because we're using WordPress. Of course, when you upload an image to WordPress, you have thumbnails generated already, so you have to pull them. Right? Didn't quite work out for us yet. We're working on that though. And then we tried this Jeremy Keith approach with conditional loading, which turned out to be extremely difficult in, in our context, in our settings, so we couldn't use it as well. But that was more interesting, actually. Um, we, we know we would think about, okay, do we need to add this couple of, code, couple of CSS lines, CSS code lines, or should we add this and so on? We were using a, uh, two typefaces on the side. So Scholar and Proxy Manola. And of course, we wanted to load regular, italic, bold, and bold italic. It's eight fonts. And once we actually integrated them all into the design, the overhead performance hit was huge. We had over 700k just for fonts. This is really, really bad. 700k for fonts. 
This is terrible. Do you agree? Yes, okay. So what we have done in this case, we removed bold italic, and we also reduced the character set for the fonts. It helped us reduce a lot, a lot. So right now we have 270K, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's still too much, way too much for mobile, right? So at some point, we felt, so we keep optimizing things, and then we wanted to have wonderful typography in the very beginning, right? But, well, we're just adding more stuff to mobile, which is not what we want. So what we've thinking, been thinking about is, shouldn't we just remove web fonts completely on mobile? It's just an overhead. It's not like people actually need them, these fonts, right? Another thing, and specifically after yesterday's Stefan, um, Stein's talk, shouldn't we remove jQuery as well? I mean, it's not like that there is so much interaction going on on the site. The desktop, yeah, but maybe we should remove it. But we decided not to do it to preserve the site's integrity. I wasn't a big fan of this idea, but we went with this. Now you're thinking, okay, so we've done all of this. What are the results? So this is how the first heat map, the first day after the new redesign, as the redesign was launched. And I, hopefully you see that there, is, there are some things going on on the side. Do you? I can do it all day long. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there, was, there were a couple of things people were clicking. So I felt, well, you know, redesign, people want to click around to explore the site. Well, how will it look, let's say, two weeks after that? So two weeks after that, oops, sorry. Um, okay, two weeks after that, it didn't look the same, but the heat map areas were similar. So people were clicking more than before the redesign. But what was also interesting is that there are some things that we actually tested in uh, our usability studies turned out to be wrong or different in, after the redesign. Just really unexpected. So for example, we found out that actually these related posts that are now displayed under articles are heavily clicked. Our usability tests were not very conclusive. Right? And also this, um, what was it? I think it's the next one. Actually, yeah. This button is actually one of the most clicked buttons on the site. Uh, so link, a back to top link. So we just you know, added back to top link in one of our usability tests just to see if it works or people use it. And although it's all the way down, this link is heavily used for some reason. Do you use it as well? No, of course you don't. Okay. I thought so, okay. But it was actually heavily used, which was a big surprise for us, actually. So many of the things that we worked on actually did work. Oh, this is how it looked uh, two weeks after that, actually. So similar pattern, right? Mm, not so much going on, but it's still good. Right now it's flattened a bit, but it's, we have still the same, um, essentially the same heat map. So we have experienced all kinds of things after the launch. And this was one of the bugs that we discovered. And I'm really eternally grateful to all the people who reported bugs to us, because our Twitter stream was filled with bug requests, and we, were, we really tried to make sure that we fix these bugs quickly. But it took a couple of weeks, actually, to be honest. So this was a moment that changed my life forever. right? So we got this, this guy, Johnny Corpy, tweeted, what is the one blog you enjoy reading most on its actual site instead of using Instapaper or your RSS reader? And Jordan Burke replied, usually smashing Mac, especially with the redesign. Oh, <laughs> it was so cool. I was so happy. It made my day uh, the day. It was wonderful. So all of the things that I mentioned in the talk, they're actually part of a chapter that I wrote recently for the smashing book free. In the, uh, free. I have a couple of books with me, and I have a couple of stickers. Please don't steal my keys, I need them. Okay, so you can, you can just come to me later on and take whatever you like, or you can pay if you like. I don't mind. I don't need to get to back to Freiburg, actually. So feel free to grab it. Or you can actually buy it. <laughs> 
bad, you know. If I have just four books, so you, you won't have a chance, I think. Um, you can also buy it, or you can come to the conference, Smashing Conference, which is going to. Um, okay, tickets are already gone, but maybe some of you will come. Anybody? Oh, nice. Well, looking forward to see you there. And yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks. Uh, questions. Looks like people woke up. Excellent. Nice questions. Well. Yes, so we, well, the question is, so, um, in the heat maps, in one of the heat maps, there so were a lot of clicks on the description. And what is actually the reason for that? And the reason for that is that people actually use, this is what our usability study showed, people actually use, just click on it to anchor, because they, on Windows especially, you can't just scroll. You need to, you need to point your, uh, your mouse at some point in the window, then you can scroll down. You know what I mean? So and we can actually capture these clicks as well. So, of course, when people, it depends on the screen, of course, but sometimes you want to start article, start reading an article, so you click on it, and then you can scroll. This is the only reason. Yes, the thing is, we're, yes. Yes, so the thing is, we're using Crazy Egg, and so far, it's not possible, actually, to distinguish between, you know, different mobile tablets and so on. So right now, we kind of have one image, and we are not quite sure where people actually click. I don't think it captures where people tap. I don't know. I, will, I have no idea. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Well, the question is, what is the ma main reason why a website should be responsive, correct? So I think in our case, maintenance and development was really extremely time-consuming and difficult. Um, I think that most situations, if you have a medium-sized website, it's very practical to have one site instead of multiple sites, which you know, adjusts itself to the device you're using. So you have to develop once, hopefully, Right? And then uh, you can adjust it as it goes, so you don't have to create a special mobile website. The, problem, the main problem that we have with responsive designs right now in, in the community in general, we don't quite know, there's actually no perfect way to optimize a responsive site to mobile, for mobile. So there are many hacks, tweaks, and so on, but I don't think there is an ultimate solution. If, if you know an ultimate solution, please come to me. Maybe we can make a big article out of it. Um, but it's, it really proved very difficult for us. We still don't know what the perfect solution is. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> the question was, uh, how well are we prepared for the next redesign? I think that we're not prepared at all. To be honest, um, the thing is, we have a couple of things. Some of the things that you've seen, uh, which have never made it to the live side, but they're still in the library. So sometimes, eventually, uh, you will have a situation where we actually launch something and then see how it performs. And if it goes well, then we develop it further and see how it performs in usability test first. And then we we'll launch it live. So we have a couple of changes. We want to change the front page a bit, uh, for example. And we have a couple of mock-ups, which if you really prompt me to, I might show, but we need to turn off the camera then. Um, so, but it's still prototype. So we think that we, we have changed a lot of things. We have changed our e-books, print books, uh, style guides, uh, business cards, all kinds of things to match this new brand or identity that we have right now. So I don't think that we're going to change it again next year. Well, definitely not this year. Yes? Oh, the print starship. Let me show it again. Well, 
the, the question is, do we have any statistics on how often people actually use our print style sheet? And the quick answer is no. And the long answer, answer is no, we can't measure it. Because w essentially we don't have a print button. People just use a command P or control P to print out. And if they're lucky enough, they actually save as PDF in Chrome. And then they see the beauty of the print, print style sheet, or they send it to the printer. Right? But you are the only luckiest people, apparently. A most or well, a large chunk of people who are lucky enough to see the print style shit. So, good for you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Can we turn off the camera first? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's it's a tricky question. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the thing is, but we really need to cut it, please. Can we do it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. OK, hi, hi guys, hi out there. Right. Uh, I will answer this question later on. <laughs> so of course, we want to make our advertisers happy, and the click rates are great. <laughs> uh, and so we just, we just had to make, well, we had certain requirements that we had to work with. And actually, we were thinking about adding a specific mobile spot for advertisers, right? <laughs> um, but the, we, had, <laughs> we, had to have this we had this requirement that we had to have advertising at 10.24. This is the latest stage where the advertising should come in. So, and it also had, had the requirement that whenever an ad was displayed in the previous design, it should be displayed in the very same position in the new design. Now, the thing is, if you resize the window in the old design, below 10.24, you will, you will not see ads anyway. It was a fixed layout, actually, before that, so you wouldn't see the ads anyway. So actually, the advertisers are not disadvantaged in any way. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> what should I say to that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, if, actually, the thing is, we, we produce our books, we produce our e-books. Uh, it helps us a lot, actually, to make sure that the site is table and we can invest more time and more money into producing good content. And thanks to you guys for coming to the site, actually. Um, the click rates are actually pretty good if you compare it to other sites, because um, most, well, our audience are web developers, web designers, and they actually trust us. So they trust, it's kind of inheritance, tr trust our advertisers as well, which is, it works for us, definitely. Yes? We we have so here's the thing, actually we um, can we have an ad server so we know exactly how many ads we uh, we have ad views we have and it's different from the number of impressions on the site because we have many people who use JavaScript deactivated for example or um, use ad blockers thank you for that as well it's always fun for us. Um, um, yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, so we know exactly how many ad impressions we have. And actually, in the beginning, I said that we had, before the redesign, we had the discrepancy between the number of page impressions and the number of ad impressions. It was pro approximately 13%, which is actually a big deal. It kind of dropped, but actually insignificantly, to 12 or 11.5%. So people do come often, more often to the site, but it's not like a really big you know, game changer for most people. Yes? Okay, so the question is how often, when we iterate, when we put something on the site, how much time does it take for us to get some results and, and get it into the uh, feedback loop again, right? Usually we wait for 50,000 views. This is something that gives us an idea of if people actually click on something, or is a feature useful or not useful. But we also like to conduct interviews, user interviews. So we have questionnaires and we have stuff, we have actual usability, uh, what's called email group, where we have 300 people who actually help us a lot to just get, give, us, give us some feedback, navigation, um, all uh, different projects that we have and so on. But 50,000 page views is something that we can work with. 
I don't know if we have time. Stop me whenever you like. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what you would have to do to get this done in like a simple way. So do you agree with the example of GitHub like the interaction with the GitHub interface and have this in no, actually. Actually, we push the um, iterations directly on the live site, and then it's a matter of three, four hours before we get the results. Because it's different. Because if you put the um, um, code on the front page, if it affects the front page, then we get results really quickly. But if it's an article, then we need to prepare it first. Right? And then, of course, we have articles that are more popular on Google anyway, so we get a lot of traffic from them almost every day. We can actually calculate how much traffic we will get from them throughout the months. So we can put the code in there and then check how it works as well. It helps us as well. Don't forget this stuff, right? I don't want to carry it with me back home. Okay? Thank you. Thanks, Vitaly. Yeah?